Hey there friends, Dave Politis, can Missing Project, a copyrighted edition for our video channel. Thank you for being here. And uh, honestly, the last 10 days have been a blur. And uh, this is the first time that I've spent uh, some kind of quiet time preparing to do one of these sessions with you in quite a while because Sometimes I pre-record these to do at a later time, but this one, uh, I'm doing it right before it's going to air, so bear with me. And the reason it's chaotic is because it's this project right here, three years of my life, and I'm doing everything I can to promote the heck out of it and to get some awareness going about what we're talking about. And in the last day, I've seen a couple comments out there from people saying things as though uh, the Higdon interview I did was uh, boring, irrelevant, and shouldn't have been in the movie. Well, I understand that everybody from all facets of life can watch this video. To say something like that when you don't understand the context of why it's in the movie bugs me a lot and I'll explain to you why I can't tell you the thousands of hours of prep that went into that movie and uh, the decisions that were made about what is in it and what was out of it and uh, I spent a lot of hours with Mr. Higdon in his house and he and his wife are two of the nicest people you could have ever met. I feel a better person to have met Carl. Do I believe his story? 100%. Do I think it's relevant to the story I presented in the movie and our research? 100%. And there was really no question if his story was going to be in the movie. When I interviewed the city attorney in Rock Springs, Wyoming, and he's in the movie, and he said, yeah, Dave, I remember that story. Yeah, it was, it's totally relevant. And Mr. Higdon, 100% honest. And when I asked him about the amount of evidence that is normally in abduction cases, he says there's none. This is one of the cases where there was evidence. And that's another reason it's in the story. And if you can remember how Mr. Higdon stated that he entered Earth again and how he arrived on terra firma, therein lies the epiphany for me of that entire story. Hurt his shoulder, etc. Now, if people don't know my research and you just watch the movie, it might seem as though there's a, a great amount of unrelated facts that I throw at you. For somebody who understands my research, I hope you get why everything was in that movie. And we strung, him, strung it along piece by piece for a specific reason. But it does... Honestly, it does bother me because other people will read this individual's comment and think, oh, well, that was stupid of him to do that. <laughs> Whatever. But I'm exhausted from doing interviews and I, I just hope that people get it and I've read hundreds of comments up to now and I'll, I'll read some to you tonight that I hope stay consistent and I'm blessed that all of you out there who have seen the movie I hope you do take the time to put an online review on some platform on Amazon wherever would be appreciated but one consistent comment i would say in a large percentage of the reviews i've read 
is that people have stated they've watched it at least twice. Several people stated, stated they watched it three, four, and five times. Some people are saying they're going to watch it over Christmas. The intent behind the movie was to give you a load of facts, associated facts, and let you come to your own conclusion. And the movie has a lot of content that's never been seen before. So I didn't throw in a lot of fluff like a lot of documentaries do who don't have a lot of content. That is the reason that so many people are saying they're watching it multiple, multiple times. And I can tell you that the first time I watched it, after we put it all together, I sat down and watched it three times because I wanted to make sure it all flowed, not in my mind, but in other people's minds as well. So if you haven't purchased the movie yet, take a screenshot of this or pause the, the video that I'm making and look at this and copy it down. But you can get DVDs and Blu-rays directly from our own online store. And if you want an online version of the movie and you can watch it right now, go to iTunes, Amazon, Vimeo, etc. There's the link. We have another huge thing that's going on. This is really going to be big. Uh, in Golden, Colorado, uh, just on the outskirts of Denver, I'll be flying in for it. And uh, it's going to be starting Thursday, January 12th. We just added a huge event. Uh, this is all sponsored by the Sasquatch Outpost in Bailey, Colorado. I mean, this is the uh, flyer for it. And uh, we added this Thursday night event. I've never done this except at a premiere, so it's going to be a first. What are we going to do? We're going to play Missing 411, the UFO Connection, in a beautiful theater in Golden. And then we've got a lot of time. We're going to sit down. I'm going to sit at the front of the audience, and I'm going to answer your questions about the movie. Talk about some stories that we haven't related to the movie, and hopefully have some fun. Well, that's Thursday night. Friday night, there's a meet and greet in Golden with me and Harvey Pratt and a host of others. And then Saturday is the conference where we'll be putting on presentations. Uh, Jim Myers from the Sasquatch Outpost, Jim and Daphne are putting this on. I've worked with them on it the last time I was there in Colorado about a week and a half ago. I like the... Uh, the facility, I like the location, and the town of Golden is awesome. If you've never been to Golden, Colorado, it's like an old town, downtown, but it's really nice. There's a lot of places with great food and great atmosphere, and thanks Jim Myers for putting it on. The Sasquatch Outpost, you go to their events section and you'll find it, and uh, hope to see you there. So... In today's segment, I've got some interesting letters. And here's the first one. Hey Dave, I was so excited for this movie because you only deliver facts. 99.5% of the shows or reports on this subject have a narrator that just leaves you hanging until the commercial is over, only to discover that they don't give you any definitive answer in the next segment. No one ever delivers an opinion. I ordered two Blu-rays but couldn't wait, so my buddy and I both ordered from Amazon. Flawless process to order. Thank you, Amazon. I have an electronic media degree from the University of Cincinnati and another from the College Conservatory of Music. However, I'm not music performance type, rather broadcasting with a touch of film. I also have an MS in criminal justice, just the same university, so your background is fascinating to me. Anyway, here's my review. I've watched it two and a half times so far. The movie is a full report of an abundance of information. In real life, I can tell you have way too much info for one movie, hence several books. So I love the chapters because you can just continue to go on to the next movie with the next chapter. The movie is well paced. Music and lighting are good. 
camera shots are great, slow and smooth. Better than many high-end camera operators in the business. I understand the filler with the landscape shots. I mean, people disappeared. So besides interviews, you must have filler. I really like the fact that you went to the areas and stood where the event took place. And just so people understand this. I could go 10 miles down the road from my house and stand in a field and say, oh, this is British Columbia. No one would ever know. But we don't do that. We go to the exact location to film. And I have never learned so much in my life from going to locations, talking to the people that were associated with the disappearances or people who knew what happened or meet the sheriff. You got to go. Costs a heck of a lot of money to get a crew around the nation. And we filmed in two countries and eight states for this film. Actually, that gave me a sense of security because you were there. Others would not go back. I was disappointed when the credits rolled. I wanted more. I appreciated that you wore your gun in the film for many reasons not related to the film. I think you did a great job speaking in it. Not sure if you had to write it out to make sure you didn't ramble, but it was nice that you did not script a punchline. Well done. The people who you interviewed, totally believable. The credits, the message to Angie, heartwarming. She is lucky to have you. The message to your son. Ben, many tears. It's like I saw you make a circle from the time you passed to the time you dedicated this movie to him. By circle, I mean final. As you said in your statement to Angie, from your darkest hours to your completion and success with monumental accomplishment. So sorry about Ben. Yes, let me tell you something. At the end of the movie, at the very end, I think two people. I would not be here. I wouldn't be here right now talking about this movie if it wasn't for Ben. I know. He set me up for success. I couldn't have done it. I couldn't have done this. No way, no how. I just wouldn't have walked that path. So, I'm very grateful for what Ben did for me. And nobody knows, nobody could know how dark my life became after I lost Ben. There's only really one person that knew that. It's Angie. And I, love, I, owe, I owe tons to her because of that. To hang in there with somebody who was depressed as I was. It's a different kind of person. I'm blessed to have her. Very blessed. Hey Dave, next next letter. Hey Dave, I love the UFO connection. I've already watched it three times in the last day. I showed it to my girlfriend last night, to my mom and dad today. The part where the alien passes the pills to that guy and he is beamed up to the spaceship with the elk is great. I believe his story because it's very similar to what Bob Lazar says about element 115. You know, it creates a force field around an object. That's probably why his bullet dropped to the floor while trying to shoot the elk. Again, great job. I was eager for months waiting for December 13th for a new documentary to drop. P.S. I also really, really like the missing 411 The Hunted. The first story was great. Keep up the good factual news. Someone needs to say the truth and you do it so well. Thank you. Thank you very much. This so next uh, letter I titled it Viruses. Hey Dave, I wanted to kind of throw an idea out here. As a Christian, I am always wondered with the origins of sickness, whether from the fall of man at the garden or from another source. It would seem to me that the UFOs, with the taking of animals and humans, and God knows what else, 
that I would actually assume as a Christian that they are satanic forces operating in the heavenlies. With the newest insight of your documentary, I would go as far as to speculate that viruses and human disease may very well come from them. I believe their mission is to also create human hybrids as well as Jesus said that the times we are in now are going to like the times of Noah again. And the time of Noah was very unique due to Nephilim operating on earth. Anyways, I don't know if it's yeah, I don't know if that's what you are getting at subtly in the documentary, but the elk with prion disease is certainly a very good find. When you really think of the idea of a virus, a floating code that has no benefit whatsoever to the human, but only seeks to destroy or just program to destroy and cause pain and suffering, in my mind, I go and conclude that it is satanic in its very nature. Anyways, I just wanted to run that by you. I knew you were busy. So it won't bother you much. I hope you're doing well. Take care. Well, in the movie, I do talk about chronic wasting disease. And again, there's a tie in there. And I think it's real. And it's uh, geographically oriented, time and space oriented. And there's too many witnesses to ignore it. So I've been kind of prepping you guys in the previous months about chronic wasting disease. And I wanted to get your educational level up on it because I think it's important. And it is the biggest national catastrophe in wildlife in our history. Nobody's talking about it. Next letter. Dave. I received my movie and I've watched it five times so far. Remember I told you? An inevitable possibility that totally makes sense. Another thought in my mind that makes sense is that our government knows all about this and is hiding it. You've done it, Dave. God and the villagers are smiling with you. Ben also has the biggest smile you ever saw too. Congratulations, my friend. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you and yours. I hope I made somebody happy with this. So, everybody remember uh, there was a big talk in the last two weeks about uh, a 20 something year old college student missing in France. He's an American. His name was uh, Ken DeLand. And his parents had stated that. Uh, he went on an excursion, cell phone went dead, the police were trying to track their credit cards. And uh, he was living in France at the time, kind of on an exchange program. I haven't said much about these cases, but I, I think it's important to talk about it. He was a missing person for a while. In one article I read on this case, it said that his mental outlook was questionable. And right from that one statement, I knew that this poor guy probably had some type of mental issues going on, probably. And as I've stated a hundred times, anyone can go and drop out of society for any reason. If I had 30 minutes with Ken, I would sit down with them and I would say, your parents love you beyond belief, beyond, beyond your understanding. When you stopped communicating with them, you took a part of their soul with you. You caused them the greatest anxiety in their lives. When you do something like this, you have to think about the ramifications it has on others. Not just you. If you need private time and you just want to not talk to anybody, tell your folks. Say, hey, I'm having some issues. I'm going to be fine, but I just need to work, work through them by myself. I'll be back in touch with you in a week or two weeks. Tell them. Don't go into darkness. 
I remember those times. I know what they're like. I remember when I hadn't heard from Ben in several days, and in my heart I knew something was really wrong. I knew when I called Los Angeles police that there was a very good chance I was going to hear back later on that night that Ben had passed on. Those moments are the worst of my life. I know some young people and some older people may have huge issues with their parents. But understand something. We are all people. We are all loving people. And I don't care what you say. The vast, vast, vast majority of parents love their kids immensely. It's the most important thing in their life. Do not walk away from them without at least telling them, you're going to be back, you're going to be fine. I just need time to myself. And if you're thinking about taking your life, have that conversation with them. Talk to them. And parents, if you have questions about your kids and their mental health, you sit down and you have that same, same conversation about you're afraid in your back of your mind that they may take their life. And anyone who tells you, oh, no, no, don't ever talk about that, don't listen to them. You have that conversation. And you talk to them about it. And then you tell them how much you love them and how much your life would be rotten to the core without them. You need them here. I don't want to preach, but I do want you to know these are important topics these days. Too many young people are taking their lives. And this leads right into this next letter. Hi Dave, let me start by saying how much my son and I love and loved your research and content. Thank you for what you're doing to get people aware of these topics. I remember the video you posted on YouTube at the beginning of January, very shortly after Ben took his life. My entire family, being fans, were crushed by the news and you and your family and Ben were in our prayers regularly. I remember thinking I couldn't imagine the pain you were going through and how hard it must be to lose a child to suicide or anything else for that matter. April 26, 2022 at 2.03 p.m. What I couldn't ever imagine I was then imagining. I got the call that my 13-year-old son shot himself in the school bathroom stall and he was conscious and in an ambulance on the way to the hospital. That insanely fast 20-minute race to the hospital is nothing more than a blur in my memory but I remember every nanosecond as I was being walked into the room he was in and without being told or realizing that I did not make it in time, he was gone. I was never able to say goodbye to him. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to write. It's been a horrible eight months and two weeks. His suicide has put me on a path I never expected to be on, but I'm going to cover every inch of this new road to help get the word out that our kids need us more than ever right now. Not a single person who knew or taught or coached Tristan had seen it coming. This Cove, Cove shit show was hard on us and even harder on our kids. The word needs to be spread so far and wide as we can. If by having you help me spread that this saves one child or adult, it was worth every tear and second put into this very hard to write email. Oh God. This is the obituary on his son that I found. Tristan Armadi, 13 years old, from Ishpeming, Michigan. Tristan was born in Ishpeming on August 27, 2008, the son of Jamie Ann and Marie and Stephen Armadi. Tristan attended the Aspen Ridge School, currently in the seventh grade. He was active in sporting activities, including football, basketball, track, and baseball along with being a competitive mountain biker and member of the Start the Cycle. Tristan also enjoyed bowling and being at camp, hunting and fishing, 
Many will remember him as a super fan of the Westwood Patriots, and like his late grandma Nancy, he was an avid Michigan State Spartans fan. Tristan was a member of both the Crossbridge and North Iron Churches in Ishpeming and the Sault Ste. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Oh, that pain. Too hard to think about. I greatly respect Tristan's dad for writing that. Greatly respect. The thought that a 13-year-old boy would have to take his life, it just guts me out. That was in the heart of COVID, too. And there's been some talk that some major cities are going to force our kids to go back wearing masks in school. As a parent, I'm sorry, my kid would not go through that right now. I'd pull him out and I'd teach him from home or I'd find a private school. There's no way I would let my kid go back into school wearing a mask. I've read too much about what wearing masks does to kids. Sorry. No way would I do it. That's just me. I don't want to. I don't want to make this political. It's not political. It's just how many kids I know of have taken their lives during COVID. Very, very saddened by your loss. Next one, I, I title it, What We Were Meant to See. Good morning, Dave. I've been following you for so long. I feel like we're old friends. I've wanted to write you so many times, but I was afraid my email would get too long. I'll try to keep it short. I have two things to tell you. First, when I heard of Ben's death, it hit me hard like a gut punch. I was heartbroken for you. Also, I have a son who was severely mentally ill, and I understand the struggles. I'm a NAMI, N-A-M-I, family to family facilitator. So stop right there. I have a binder about five feet from me from when I took the NAMI class. Like I've stated before, anybody who has mental illness, family member who lives with someone who has mental illness, either one of those, you both need to get into a NAMI class. It's free. It's one of the best classes I've ever taken in my life. I highly recommend the class to anyone with a loved one or mental illness. The class is free and is more than people can ever imagine. 100% agree. 100% agree. Two, the same day you announced you had gotten Huck, my husband and I found an abandoned, lost Great Pyrenees way out in the country. Nothing but ranches and farmland for miles. She was standing in the middle of the road. At first, my husband thought it might be a sheep. We picked her up and took her to a vet. She did not have a chip. But she did have heartworms, which we treated. We named her Angel, and I believe she really is an angel. I also believe she was a working dog before we found her. Today, you shared more information about that amazing Pyrenees that saved his flock, so I just had to send you my great Pyrenees story about my angel. Here's my Facebook post about it. Oh my God, you won't believe the morning I just had. This morning, I went out to feed the chickens. When I opened the gate, my rooster, Romeo, darted out before I could stop him. But he quickly realized he'd made a mistake when he came face to face with my boxer, Kayla, who picked him up in her mouth. Romeo quickly escaped without injury, but this time my husky buddy heard the commotion and decided to join in on the fun and chase Romeo around the backyard for a bit. All the while, I'm running behind this crazy group yelling, Kayla, buddy, no, no. Then my great, big, beautiful Great Pyrenees angel came to the rescue. She's a herding dog, so she went right to work and helped me herd Romeo around behind the barn and next to the chicken pen. She kept him there and made the dog stay back. At this point, Romeo scared to death and got nearly cocksure of himself as he usually is. He just hunkered down and curled up by the fence and let me pick him up and put him in the back by the chicken yard. Well, that was exciting. I guess I've had my calisthenics for today. I hope my email isn't too long and I hope you enjoy my angel story. Yeah, I did. <laughs> It's a great name for a great Pyrenees angel. In a lot of ways, Huck was an angel for me. 
So, things you are meant to see. Now in life we have these crossroads. Now maybe if this lady had a, had a left 10 minutes earlier, Angel wouldn't have been in that road. She wouldn't have seen him. And it just reminded me of a story that happened just the other day. Angie and I were in Colorado for a big family gathering. And uh, we had some downtime. So some family members went to this very small city in Colorado. And they had this little antique store. And we just were walking through the antique store looking around. And I walked around the corner. And sitting on this stand, <laughs> staring right at me, was a book about Montana fishing. The book was 50 years old. Angie's brother walked up and goes, Dave, you're meant to see that. I started to thumb through it and I thought, I don't have time to go through all this book. I'll just buy it. So now it's sitting in my bookcase and come summer, I'll read it. But I think that, like you said, I think it was meant to, I was meant to see it. <laughs> it was meant to be there. And just like this lady, she was meant to see Angel. And how many times in life that we call that maybe a coincidence? But was it really? Or was our path maybe defined our path at birth? Or maybe our path was defined in the last couple of weeks that we were going to walk by that place at that time and find that dog or find that book? Who knows? New letter. Hey Dave, I'm a new subscriber to your YouTube channel. I love the channel and your Missing 411 shows. I'm patiently awaiting Missing 411, the UFO connection. I live in Whitehorse in the Yukon and have a couple of stories that I wanted to share with you. Both of those occurrences happened in 2014. If you've never been to Whitehorse, you need to go. Uh, it's a unique city. I like it. I've been there five times, six times. Anyhow, around late summer 2014, my husband and I decided to drive to Skagway, Alaska for the day. The weather was perfect, not too hot or sunny. On our way home, we decided to stop at the desert in Carcross, Yukon, to take in the scenery. We left to continue our journey home at approximately 5 p.m. We were driving north on the South Klondike Highway. Usually, this is a busy highway, but I noticed that we were the only ones on the road. All of a sudden, there was a huge, large shadow blocking the sun over our truck and in front of us. We assumed it must have been an airplane. It seemed to follow us for maybe a minute. Then the shadow moved in front of the truck and we could see that it was a perfect triangle. After about 30 more seconds, it took off at an alarming speed and disappeared out of sight. I also want you to know that there was no sound at all. We actually turned the music off in the truck so we could hear the airplane. We pulled over to look at the sky, but we could see nothing. My husband swears to this day that it was just a cloud. I personally have never seen a cloud in the shape of a perfect triangle or a cloud that moves that fast. Good point. <laughs> Second occurrence, also in the fall of 2014. At the time, we lived off the grid on First Nations land. It was a very peaceful area with lots of wilderness around us. We had a neighbor that would let their horses roam around and they would often come to our house for treats. My favorite horse was a big white draft horse. He would often wander over and wait at the back porch. On this day, I was reading a book under my open window. It was an overcast day, but warm enough to have all the windows open in the house. The next thing I hear is a thud, thud, thud outside my window. I assumed that it was my favorite horse coming over for treats. I thought to myself that it was weird how fast that horse was moving. I got up and went to the back porch to see the horse. And there was nothing there. Then the smell hit me. It smelled worse than anything I've ever smelled in my life. It was so strong, my eyes started to water. My husband told me it was just a bear. I've been very close to bears, and they do smell bad, but nothing compared to what I smelled that day. I told my neighbors about the experience, and they said it was just the Sasquatch that lives in the area. They told me not to be scared, and they are the protectors of the forest. Unfortunately, I'm still scared of them. I hope you enjoy these stories. If you're ever in the Yukon, I would love the opportunity to meet you and possibly get one of your books autographed. Happy holidays. Thanks for that story. Happy holidays to you, too. I'd like to hear 
how and why your neighbors think that was a neighborhood Sasquatch. Do they have some story there? I don't know. Hey Dave, this, is, this might be uh, a little longer than you like, but here you go. Movie 3. I watched the latest movie the other day and wow. I don't want to speak too soon, but it actually looks like progress is being made in understanding what could be going on in at least some of the cases. The drop-offs of victims and potential victims in the case from the movie really make me think. Assuming that these things, whatever they are, have an understanding far beyond ours and act in a way that is efficient and achieves certain criteria, think not being seen when they don't want to be seen, I often have to wonder why they drop people in the way that they do, especially if they aren't above actually landing and talking with humans like in the movie. Is it as simple as saving time? Is that even a limitation to them? Why? You would think that if they had could manipulate gravity, they would become more flexible to them, which brings me to my next point. Aha, but hold on a second. Hold your taters. Why do you always think, why do some people always think that whatever's doing this is something good, something positive, something that cares, something that's loving? No. What if they look at you just like an animal? Plump. Just like a cow. Plump. Why? I don't know. I'm no physicist, but it makes sense to me that if you consider the relationship between space, time, and gravity, parentheses, think, your time slows down the closer you get to a black hole, end of parentheses, then it's no wonder that these things appear to be moving and changing direction at impossible speeds. Perhaps from their frame of reference, their speed is a lot lower. The main objective in these craft being piloted by a biological entity is that the G-forces experienced during such maneuvers would be essentially incompatible with life. But then again, if they have technology, they can manipulate gravity. G-forces are suddenly not much of a concern. It also makes me think that the incident with the elk not moving isn't due to some kind of interference with their nervous system or introductions or some chemical. Perhaps they can just slow their targets on time through the manipulation of gravity. This would line up with a theoretical prediction of what it would be like to see a, someone fall into a black hole as they pass the event horizon. One change would be that their image slows to the point where it freezes before slowly fading. It's also maybe how these animals die. Picture this. You're operating at your normal speed with time being normal from your frame of reference. You use your device to manipulate the gravity or whatever in the vicinity of the elk so that their time slows way down to the point where, from your point of view, they aren't moving at all. This would mean that for every second that the elk believes is passing, a huge length of time would be passing for you. This is believed to be roughly how relativity would work when it comes to time being different from the reference points of different observers. I wonder if it's possible that their victim beings die because there's a difference in the speed of the flow of the time between them and the general rate on earth what if while they're exposed to this they can expend most of their lifespan while everything else on earth is proceeding at regular time i can think of a few things that might disprove this but i figured it was an interesting thought yeah it is anyway i can't express how glad i am to see you doing well lately i can't i can see from personal experience that getting a dog can help so much with getting someone out of a dark place completely expected that beautiful tribute to Ben in the film and I'm happy you're, you're, you've had a partner that has supported you through what I would guess is the hardest times you, a person can manage. Also I would like to ask you about something that I see so often that I'm curious as to why it's said at all. Please don't take any offense to this. I'm not making accusation, accusation simply wondering what the hell people are, are all about. I'm sure you've seen the usual hater types in the comments section and other people's missing persons videos. Thanks for removing that kind of stuff in yours. Our community is great. It's abundantly clear to me what kind of person you are now and whether that's who you've always been or who you grew to be, I greatly respect you for being that person. You're an empathic individual who doesn't just see a missing persons case and feel bad. You're persistently researching, making context for the human intelligence side, educating people on the severe, often unseen epidemic of mental illness 
that is ravaging lives and leaving people broken and alone in the government cage. And the most incredible, providing genuine hope and a light at the end of the tunnel for people suffering from these things. I read countless comments the other day on one of your videos where people who don't even know you at all, personally, real life, otherwise say that because of you, your work, they were lifted out of their depression. We tell the depressed to know that their life has meaning. But it's on a whole other level with you, Mr. Politis. Your life is meaningful to not only your close contacts in real life, but you have made trailblazing achievements in the investigation and popularization of the details and the most mysterious disappearances in the world. And although other channels may seem to parrot your information and not do much research at all, a good number of these channels still make facts known to be a completely different audience who might have seen this information if they weren't aware of the personal outlets of your work, your radio appearances, and discovery, etc. To open up for a moment, I've watched your channel from the moment you started these weekly uploads, the ones featured you in a room outdoors and reading cases. After Ben, I was genuinely worried that if your path went to the wrong place and people around you weren't as great as I know now that they are, you may have had blinders on as people often do in those situations, not thinking of how things will affect others and might have considered following your son. This would have been a horrific tragedy to anyone who has ever interacted with you. Even through an on-screen, you're not only a wonderful and genuine person, something less and less common these days, but your work is helpful and has the potential to help so many people that have lost loved ones to whatever is going on. Outside of whatever high-powered teams of profilers or whatever else these three-letter agencies obviously have investigating this stuff, you're perhaps the most likely person in the public to discover enough information from past cases and by talking to people that down the line somewhere, there's a decent chance we will be able to put at least a few of the pieces together and grain a small but working understanding of what's happening. The powers to be certainly aren't going to release their findings, so you're the biggest hope for anyone we have. It's an indescribable joy to see the good outcomes still happen. And you had a person, and probably a dog, who thinks she's a person to turn on some lights and bright things up for you. I can hear it in your voice and laughter. I know that life after these things is still difficult at times. My depression took over in situations where very much loved ones were no longer with us. But the brain is an incredible thing. If you practice at something, the brain will rewire. And you will get better with skill over time. That's true. Well, those are the letters for today. Some of those were hard, and life is hard. Life isn't easy. Sometimes life gets too hard for some people. You gotta remember, as bad as your day might be today, it's doubtful it's gonna be worse tomorrow. And if you hang around people that love you, they're gonna make sure that you see the light of that next day. I wrote a book called Missing 411, A Sobering Coincidence. It's about people, predominantly young white males, who disappear. They had been usually drinking, consuming alcohol. And then they're found in water. About half the time, the cause of death is drowning. And about half the time, they can't determine the cause of death talked about this a lot. A subgroup that I don't talk about enough probably is medical professionals. Some of you have known that I've talked about physical therapists, two of them in Alaska that disappeared in a very short time frame to each other. And those two didn't know it, but they grew up very close to each other. Strange. I've written about physicians who have disappeared under very strange circumstances. Well, I've also talked about nurses. And tonight, I'm going to talk to you about one of the other nurses. This case has bothered me since the day I first wrote about it and I first did my research about it. Because it's one of those things where I know that his parents had a really, really good young man. And the thought that he's not here after all the good he's done for this world and as good a job as they did raising him, 
I need to tell this story. This is Paul Kochu, K-O-C-H-U. He was 22 years old. He went missing December 16th, 2014 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Paul was an athlete. He went to Owen J. Roberts High School in Pottstown, PA. He played varsity football and baseball. And he told friends before he even went into high school that he wanted to be a nurse. And he was an outstanding student got great grades, and he lived by a statement, quote, wanting to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. Think about that. Wanting to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. What that says, be yourself. Chase your own dreams. Don't chase somebody else's. Well, when he graduated from uh, Owen J. Roberts High School, he had already applied for Duquesne University School of Nursing, and he ended up graduating from nursing school in May 2014. And he immediately got hired by Allegheny General Hospital in Pittsburgh in their ICA, ICU unit. That's the kind of guy Paul Kochu was. Parents should have been very proud of this young man. Friends described him as super witty and super smart. In downtime's time off, he liked to golf, play baseball, and fish. Exactly the stuff I love to do. Well, on December 15th, 2014, Paul lived near the area of downtown Pittsburgh. And he commuted a short distance to Allegheny Hospital. Well, on that night, he and his roommates made a short walk through downtown from their apartment to a place called Smoke and Joe's Restaurant on Carson Street in Pittsburgh. And they were gonna sit there and watch Monday Night Football. Sounds like a perfect night to me. With your buddies hanging out. Great idea. Well, the guys hung out and at about midnight, Paul stated he had too much to drink and he was gonna go back to the apartment and he headed off. About 30 minutes later, his roommates get a call that Paul said that he had broken some glass and he'd cut his hand and he needed some help stopping the bleeding. He was a nurse, so maybe with one hand he couldn't get it shut down. So roommates went back, quickly got home, and they described the cut as not real big. It was small and they got it under control. But then they both described something really unusual happened. Paul got into a physical alterca altercation with his roommates. They said it never happened before. Paul wasn't that kind of guy. And the roommates, in an effort to de-escalate the situation, decided to leave. And they went down to the local McDonald's. And they returned about an hour later at 2 a.m. And they thought Paul was asleep in his room. So they didn't really think much about it. Well, the next morning, the roommates wake up and they go into Paul's room and they realize he hadn't slept in his bed. So they called his brother and they reported Paul as missing. First of all, Paul is no easy target. 6'1", 185. He's a decent sized man. And he was in great shape. It's a wanted poster put out by Pittsburgh police. Police were called. They come to the house. They go into his room, and they found that his keys to his car, his Volvo, are there. His phone. I'm sorry, the keys to the Volvo are not there. His wallet's not there, and his phone's not there. But the car is still there at the house, or the apartment. They try calling the cell phone, and it goes straight to voicemail. So it was either shut off or battery was dead. Car never moved. And on December 18th, a couple days later, he didn't arrive at the 7 a.m. shift at the hospital. And they knew something was really, really wrong. The Pittsburgh police brought in a series of canines, ground pounders, 
They found nothing. They couldn't pick up a scent trail. They, they found nothing unusual. But the parents of Paul made a public statement that this type of behavior by their son is exactly opposite of Paul's normal, normal behavior. And that he had never had mental health issues in his past. And they couldn't understand what was happening. Jack and Ellen drove in from several hours away and participated in the search. His sister just flew in from Southern California. This was a major emergency to the family. Well, the Pittsburgh police did their job as well. They called in the two roommates and they had them take polygraph tests. And it was the opinion of multiple polygraph examiners that the roommates were telling the truth. They didn't know what happened to Paul. Um, they did have this skirmish earlier in the night, but it was nothing major. They didn't know. So, the police keep investigating, and this gets major press in Pittsburgh. Well, there's CCTV footage that's given to the police from the south side of Pittsburgh at a Giant Eagle store that's the last confirmed sighting at 2.27 a.m. of Paul. And here's what's really unusual about this. Let me explain this map to you. Get up close for you here. So, Paul's residence was in downtown Pittsburgh near Smoke and Joe's restaurant. So he goes from the restaurant, goes to his residence, and then about an hour and a half, two hours later, he's last seen on CCTV footage about six and a half miles south of the downtown area at this Giant Eagle store, walking by it. This is out in the middle of nowhere in Pittsburgh. There's no rivers, there's no water, there's no creeks, there's no nothing out there. What would he be doing there? Well, that, of course, is the million-dollar question. And that was the last time anyone had a sighting of Paul Gotchu. Now, fast forward three, four months, March 19th, 2015 on the Ohio River in Wheeling, West Virginia, a person notices a body in the river face down. It's on the north end of Wheeling Island. Police pull the body out and it's nude except for a watch. Well, the coroners did an autopsy and they found that uh, the body had some broken ribs and one was a dislocated rib. And one of the coroners stated that they thought that the water in the river had ripped his clothes off, except Dr. Cyril Wecht, who participated in his own autopsy, said he didn't think so. Came back as an unknown cause of death with a blood alcohol level of 0.15%. Now it's 59 miles from Pittsburgh to the location in West Virginia quite a distance. 59 miles. They didn't walk that. So the implication by many of the people was that Paul must have went in the river in Pittsburgh. One big problem with that is that there's no rivers anywhere near this. Closest one, about five miles away. And how would he get in the river? Nobody saw him go in. He had no mental health issues. One thing that I've, I've, I implied almost is starting two years ago now, that it's important where people live and where they grew up. In the case of two physical therapists who disappeared in the same city in Alaska, within months of each other. Didn't know each other. S seemingly no attachments to each case. 
But when I dug into the background of both, they both grew up in the States, just a couple miles from each other. Is that a coincidence? Well, I don't know, but that's a data point you need to remember. Now, in Paul's case, he grew up adjacent to the Schuylkill River in Northwest Philadelphia. Is that important? I don't know. It's a data point. Now, Paul's family, mom and dad, made a statement that they thought that there was foul play involved. Corner stated that they had no idea how he got in the river, but that the broken ribs indicated that there was some type of blunt force trauma against the side of his body. Did he fall on something? Did something kick him? Did he get dropped? Good questions. Now in this incident, think about this, and then I'm gonna remember the following points. He was a young, healthy white male, athletic, consuming alcohol, separated from friends. Somehow ends up in the water. There's no path to the water. Nobody sees him enter the water. Canines can't track him. There's alcohol in his system. Cause of death in all of these cases is either drowning or unknown. He wasn't tested for GHB and parents and friends and family believe foul play is involved. Friends, those exact, exact profile points play out in cases in the USA, Canada, the UK, Spain, and Australia. Many times, the victims in the U.S. grew up next to a river or next to the Great Lakes. Can't ignore it. Cannot ignore it. And I told you about Paul's case because it's fairly recent. You know, just eight years ago. I know that the loss still plays on his sister and his brother and his parents. But remembering his quote, wanting to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. If you believe in the creator, then you were placed here to do something. You just haven't found out what that is yet. But why try to be someone else? Just be yourself. You'll either be accepted or you'll be pushed aside, but your style, the way you speak, your manner, the empathy you show, it's all important things. Be yourself. Chase your own dream. Because if you're chasing a dream that you really want in your heart, few things are going to get in between you and that dream. And I can only speak for myself. I knew when I was in junior high school I was going to be a policeman. I just knew it. How did I know it? I don't know. <laughs> All through high school, I knew it. Now, did I ever tell my folks? Heck no. <laughs> my dad was a policeman, then he became a fireman later in life, and he always thought being a policeman was a horrible job. And he said, Dave, it's really dangerous. People don't like you. Well, I didn't care about any of that. <laughs> I just knew I wanted to be a policeman. I went to college because I knew that if you had a degree, you'd, do, you'd have better writing skills. If you ever want to do something later in life, you could do it. You'd have the degree in your pocket. So I got the degree. I knew it was important. And then when I was a policeman, I went back to school and got a master's degree. That was all on me. I knew, I knew I wanted to do that. I didn't care what anybody else wanted. And when I got to that point where I started to test for different police departments, I took my mom aside and I told her because she was much more sensitive 
listening type than my dad. And I said, how do I approach dad about this? She goes, let me break it to him. And then the next time I was there, maybe four or five days later, we sat down around the dinner table and he said, hey, I know you need to do what you need to do. And I'll always accept you for that. He says, it's an honorable thing, what you're doing. So don't think it's anything bad. I just wanted you to stay out of harm's way, as every parent would. And then as, as I went on, my dad was all checked into me being a cop and we talk about it all the time, so. But I have deep, deep compassion for Paul's family. I don't know what happened. I do know that I've got at least a book and a half filled with this. This story was in Missing 411 Law, Land, Air, Water, and how I tied all of those cases together. So in the meantime, Missing 411, the UFO connection is still going like a rocket ship. Please, if you watched it, post a review online. Tell your friends to watch it because we need the help. I know a lot of people don't want to read books. I, I understand that. That's why Ben and I started to do videos. Then we did the movies. And we're reaching a higher and higher audience base. we still got some time before Christmas. And if you're having a difficult time finding a gift for somebody, personal locator beacon or missing 411 hat you got these beanies in stock so a lot of things but you are truly important thanks for being here please share this video online I, I'm, I have great gratitude for you so thank you have a good week Politis out.